If you look at the schedule for the talk, you'll find that um, this worksheet is online if you want to look at it. So in case you um, find the... Yeah, reminder. Okay, thank you. I did. I just started it. Um, so there will be a screencast of this. So the talk, basically, I'm going to tell you about three things related to piotic L functions in um, SAGE for elliptic curves. Piotic L functions are something that exist in a lot more generality than just attached to elliptic curves, but I'll focus primarily on that context um, because that's what SAGE has in it. SAGE doesn't have any functionality for working with any other piotic L series right now, even though there are some that are easier and some that are harder, but SAGE only has implementations for elliptic curves. So the talk is mainly going to be what's in SAGE right now, um, what is in PSAGE, and how does it compare to what's in SAGE for piotic L functions, and what I wish were in SAGE by the end of this week. Okay. Um, I'm going to make the assumption that you are familiar with elliptic curves, their L series, and the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture, and hopefully have some passing familiarity with piotic L series of elliptic curves, though I will briefly recall the definition right here. So, um, what is the piotic L series of an elliptic curve? So, the situation for um, the talk is we're always going to have a fixed elliptic curve E defined over Q, and a prime number P. And the one constraint on P is it's not a prime of additive reduction. So it can be a prime of good reduction or of multiplicative reduction. That Those are both fine, but additive reduction is not allowed. can also be a prime of super singular reduction. Again, that's just not good. Or, I mean, sorry, not um, ordinary. But that's also fine. So we allow super singular. Basically, the only constraint is that P is not a prime of additive reduction. Um, so I'll write P squared does not divide the conductor of the curve. Then in that um, situation, there's an L series attached to the elliptic curve. It's a formal, you can view it as a formal power series over the piotics. Um, in the case when, or in most cases, the power series has coefficients in QP, but sometimes it has coefficients in a quadratic extension of QP. So here's what the definition um, looks like. This is not complete. You have to do a little bit more to give a um, complete rigorous definition but at least it'll give you some sense of how you can attach a piotic power series to an elliptic curve. So given an elliptic curve E over Q, as we just did, and a prime um, power P to the N, P can even be 2 or whatever, um, but to avoid issues which will probably arise if P were 2, like this isn't quite right, uh, let's assume P is odd, um, and a Dirichlet character chi that's primitive of conductor P to the N, you can associate a number which is given on the right-hand side right there. So LPE chi, this is a function that takes as input such characters and outputs that algebraic, into, or algebraic number. So it's P to the N times a Gauss sum times um, the L function of the elliptic curve twisted by the character chi bar evaluated at 1, which is some algebraic number, divided by the period omega E of the elliptic curve. And so as you run through various primitive Dirichlet characters chi, you get lots of numbers this way. And if you fix an embedding of Q bar in CP, you get lots of numbers in CP in this way. And in order to um, give you a power series, what you do is, or what we're going to do is define a function on the disk of rate, the open disk of radius one about the point one um, that's got by basically extending this definition to, a, to um, limits of such characters. Okay? So the way you do it as follows. So given an element U in the open disk of radius 1, about 1, you can define a um, character that looks a lot like one of these characters as follows. It's a homomorphism from ZP star to CP star. It uh, kills the P minus first roots of unity. So it projects onto 1 plus um, PZP. And then what it does is it sends a generator, 1 plus P, of 1 plus P inside of ZP star to that element U. So for each number U, in the disk of radius 1, about 1, you get a specific character. And to each of those characters, by taking a limit of something that looks like 
what I just wrote down up there, you get a specific complex, p-adic complex number. So in that way, you've defined a function, or originally Maser, Tate, and Teitelbaum defined a function on the open unit disk about um, 1 in CP. So there you are. Um, and it turns out that by being careful about definitions and applying some theorem, if you look at Maser, Tate, Teitelbaum, you can see the details. Um, you see that, in fact, this function on the open unit disk is p-adic analytic, so it's given by a power series. And the p-adic L-series of the elliptic curve is that power series. And that's what I'll denote by L sub p e comma t. It can be computed in at least two different ways that I'm familiar with. Um, one way involves p-adic integration, but not in a terrifyingly complicated manner that uh, somebody like Robert Coleman would get really excited about, but um, really, really kind of naive straightforward p-adic integration that just involves Riemann sums and modular symbols. So this is, in fact, um, what the implementation I'll talk about most today involves. Um, and I'll give a formula in the next slide with some undefined quantities that um, are really defined in a fairly easy way involving modular symbols um, that shows you how to do this. But basically, you can write this same function as an integral of a certain character um, against a certain measure that's defined using modular symbols. And then you simply evaluate that integral by using Riemann sums. If you refine enough, then you'll get a certain amount of precision out. And then by just chasing some arguments, you can see that it's equivalent to this definition. Um, you can find all the details of exactly how that works with um, very, very careful bounds on precision and so on in a paper that um, Chris Wethrock and I are, um, wrote that will appear in MathComp. So there's their p-adic integration approach, but again, it's the like, really, really basic p-adic integration, Riemann sums, really. Um, and then another approach involves overconvergent modular symbols. And I'll say a little bit about that at the end. Um, the overconvergent modular symbols approach, its primary advantage, um, if you only want to evaluate this L-series to very low precision, then there's really no advantage to either approach. They're about the same. But if you want it to high precision, or high might be big O of P cubed, or P to the fourth, so not very high, like you want more than one digit, then um, you already get a substantial speed up in some cases using overconvergent modular symbols. And this can give you, in fact, you know, 20 or 30 digits p-adically, um, no problem at all. But um, if you only want very, very low precision, and for a lot of applications, all you need is the p-adic L-series mod P. For that sort of application, then um, the Riemann sums approach is very good. So they're really complementary approaches. Each has its um, value. And I'll show an example at the end where you desperately want to use the overconvergent modular symbols approach to get one more digit, because things get a lot slower if you don't. Um, and then uh, I'm, I'm going to revisit this theme several times in the talk, but there is uh, a reason that people care about computing with p-adic L-series of elliptic curves, not just defining them and working with them. Um, but there's a lot of theoretical work of Kato and Peter Schneider and Perrin Ryu and uh, many other people, uh, Ralph Greenberg, that um, allows you to go from information about the p-adic L-series to information about the Selmer group or shafrevich tate group of your elliptic curve. The reason for that is that uh, this is a very analytic definition involving uh, Taylor series that is got by knowing a certain function is analytic, but there's an alternative way of defining this whole setup that involves constructing a module over something called the Uesawa algebra and then asking for its characteristic power series. And if you go via that approach, you get something called the algebraic p-adic L function. And there's a conjecture called the main conjecture of Uesawa theory, which says that these two power series are the same up to a unit. And um, a lot has been proved about that conjecture. But the thing is, the algebraic p-adic L series, it encodes information about the um, structure of the Selmer group of your elliptic curve as you go up the cyclotomic ZP extension and so on. And there's a control theorem that, of Maser that lets you go back down to Q. So um, putting all that together, you find that uh, an enormous amount has been proved in the direction of that conjecture. And um, the connection between these two definitions, well, this one's very amenable to computation, whereas the other one isn't in a lot of cases. So if you can compute this one, then you can derive a lot of information about, for example, Schaffer-Rich Tate groups and Mordell Vey groups and so on of certain elliptic curves. So that's the main application. So um, it's not something you just compute for fun to see a series that pops out and put in a table. Um, you can actually apply any examples of computing this to get potentially highly non-trivial information that cannot be obtained via any other method at all. OK, um, so for the Riemann sums algorithm, this is basically the algorithm. It's kind of one line long. Um, 
When you implement it, of course, it gets a little bigger, but basically this is what it boils down to. There's a sequence of polynomials, P sub n of t, that are defined as a double sum. So notice that as n gets bigger, the number of sum ends in the sum gets bigger in a way that you probably don't like as a computational number theorist. Um, there's P to the n minus 1 terms in the inner sum and P in the out, so it's big O of P to the n terms here. And even inside, you have some stuff that you might find a little annoying. Um, I haven't defined what alpha is or what omega a is or mu sub alpha. Um, alpha is just a root of x squared minus apx plus p in the p-adics that has um, ord p less than 1. And mu sub alpha is a measure that you write down explicitly using the modular symbols attached to the elliptic curve. So um, there's just a simple formula for it. And um, uh, there's a theorem that you can prove, which is that this sequence of polynomials p sub n converges to the p-adic L-series. So that power series that I defined before, um, that I said just exists because a certain function is analytic, this gives you it. Um, what happens is, as you increase n, these coefficients sort of stabilize, they're congruent to each other, and they're also congruent mod some power of p to the corresponding coefficients of the p-adic L-series. And by being careful, you can see exactly how congruent they are. And um, you can find, again, exact bounds for how that works in the um, paper with Rutherford that we wrote. So um, one approach to computing the biotic L-series, which is good when the precision you want is very small, is you compute something like P sub 2 uh, or P sub 3, which is not too big of a sum, although it, um, well, there are issues. So what's in SAGE? So SAGE has a pretty general implementation of computing piatic L-series. You can just give it an elliptic curve and a prime. And the only constraint on the prime is that the piatic L-series is actually defined. So um, the prime can't be a prime of additive reduction. But the situation of um, good reduction, ordinary reduction, super singular reduction, multiplicative reduction, split and non-split, all those cases are implemented, which is nice. So it's a very general implementation, um, well documented, lots of examples. It's been used a lot. Um, but it is very slow. And just to give you a sense of what the code looks like, here's just, um, this is kind of like the inner loop. There's various functions that get called in here. Self.measure is that use of alpha thing, but that double loop that I showed you before, looks like we switched the order in, for some reason, but here it is in the Sage code. And this is um, some interpreted Python code in the file, I think probably, uh, well, the file is linked to right here. Um, it's called piatic lseries.py in the schemes elliptic curves directory. So um, it's pretty straightforward to read. It looks a lot like the formula that's in the paper. There's no like special case if p is at most some number, et cetera, et cetera. It's just fairly straightforward code. Um, but if you look at the top, you'll find some funny things. So for example, um, you might have expected that we would make the elements, that we would make this definition involve, say, p-adic numbers in some way. But what happens is, um, you define a power series ring over the rational numbers, and you do all the arithmetic in this power series ring over the rational numbers, and then at the very end, you turn things into um, p-adic series. That's what you can see happening right here. Um, so at the, bend, at the end, you make the um, p-adic power series ring, and then you coerce back. And the reason is because if you don't do that, it's just really slow. So um, because power series over the p-adics are not as fast as power series over the rationals. Power series over the rationals are really, um, an element is really a polynomial over the rationals and a precision. And polynomials over the rationals are very fast because um, Sebastian wrote something on top of Flint that makes polynomials over the rationals very fast. Polynomials over the p-adics are, I don't know what they are, but um, or power series over the p-adics are probably polynomials over the p-adics plus some extra precision information. And um, at least when we wrote this, they were much slower than polynomials over the rationals. So even though maybe this uses a little more memory, um, in practice it's much faster to do things this way at present. So let me show you a little demo of how easy this is to use. This should work in basically any version of Sage from the last year or two. Um, and by the way, the actual code was mostly written by me and Chris Wethrick. So I did, I think, the good ordinary case and the most straightforward case. And he did all the um, tricky cases, so super singular reduction, um, Split and non-split multiplicative reduction. Those are pretty tricky to implement. The implementations are pretty slow compared to what I think is theoretically possible, as I'll try to convince you. But at least you have the fairly general implementations. 
Um, also, um, I think Mark Watkins and Steve Donnelly uh, ported some of this code back over to Magma, and they found some bugs which they then told us about, which we fixed. So they also contributed to this. Okay, so here's here's what you do. You just um, take an elliptic curve. You do e dot p attic l series, and give it a number, and uh, there you are. And then you can ask for the l series. So it's just some object, and um, the notation you say so l is just the l series sort of sitting there abstractly. If you say l dot series, then it gives you back a power series where the coefficients um, are correct to the precision that you see here, and the um, number right there that's the n in the formula I showed you before. It's the nth approximation to the piatic L series. So if you make it smaller, you get a less good approximation. If you make it bigger, you'll get uh, an approximation to higher precision. Uh, but it takes substantially longer. In fact, it takes p time, roughly p times longer every time you increase this number by 1, because it's an exponential algorithm. Um, another thing, there's another sort of constant factor that I'm not, that's not visible in this example, which is that in order to compute the piatic L series at all, the first thing it does is it computes the modular symbol space of that level and um, cuts out the piece of the modular symbol space that corresponds to the elliptic mm -hmm. curve. I'm not sure if by default it uses, and I'll, I want to look this up actually, um, Cremona's modular symbols implementation or the one that's in Sage. Let's see. Uh, so by default it uses the one that's in Sage. But if you set use EC lib equals to true, and your curve has at all large conductor, it'll be dramatically faster. For a curve of small conductor, it'll make essentially no difference. But for large conductor, it makes an enormous difference. EC lib is um, a highly, highly opt the most optimized implementation of computing with modular symbols of weight two and trivial character. And um, that's exactly the modular symbols you need for this calculation. So. Um, if you have an elliptic curve and the conductor is pretty large and you just try to do this and you find it super slow to even get going, then just look at the documentation, see that there's something called use EC lib. Um, basically, everything looks the same. I have no idea why it's false by default, but um, I think I've complained about that before. But uh, it, well, this is just cached, but, um, but what it, it'll get going more quickly. So the initial constant time factor to start before you can compute any piatic L series will be reduced substantially. Because Cremona's implementation is simply, I mean, it's the same algorithm as what's implemented in Sage, but it's a lot more optimized. Because he's, um, you know, he's been working on that code for like 20 or 30 years, specifically for the purpose of enumerating elliptic curves. So that one calculation you can do way more quickly um, than any other code out there by far. Okay, um, another example, so you can say ask for the piatic L series at an additive prime, and it gives you an error message. So that's implemented, giving you an error message. Um, let's see, you can ask for the uh, piatic L series at a prime of multiplicative reduction. I don't know if this one's split or non-split, but there it is. And you can ask for the series, and there you see it. Um, and you can ask for it to higher precision again. Um, here's one that, where things are really nutty. So. A2 for this elliptic curve is 2, so that's a prime of super singular reduction, but it's good, good super singular reduction. You can still ask for the piatic L series at p equals 2, and you can get the series. It does give a warning because apparently the normalization might not be correct. Um, I'm not sure what the issue is with that, but if anybody is really into wanting to polish some detail of piatic L series, maybe you can try to figure out what's going on there. So at p equals 2, I think it's apparently correct up to some scalar up to some uniform scalar, and it prints that message to let you know. Um, it would be nice if that were improved. Um, and notice here there's an alpha. That's because it's a super singular prime, so the piatic L series, instead of having coefficients in QP, has coefficients in a quadratic extension of QP. OK, so now let me show you um, this application I alluded to. This is why I care about piatic L series, because there's basically there's an analog of the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture where the complex L function is replaced by a piatic L function. And all the other quantities are the same, except the regulators replaced by a piatic analog of the regulator. And there's an extra factor you have to throw in. And in the case of split multiplicative reduction, the order of vanishing is one bigger, so you have an L invariant. But besides all that, it's basically just BSD, where, you, where you've um, come up with ways of replacing the real numbers by piatic numbers. Um, and the cool thing is that even for curves of rank bigger than or equal to 2, at a given prime p, if you make certain hypotheses, you actually know this conjecture. Um, or at least you know a large amount about it. 
If you want to find a sort of survey of exactly what we know about this conjecture, again, look at this paper by me and Chris Wethrick. It has like 20 pages or so just surveying the status of periodic BSD. Um, okay, so what this means is that if you take this particular elliptic curve, 389A of rank 2, and ask for um, its Schaffer-Ibich Tate group shots, just some formal object in SAGE, so it's just kind of a silly thing, but if you say shot up P primary bound, what it does is it computes the 5-adic L series, the 5-adic regulator, um, looks up some theorem, and deduces from the calculations that the power of P that divides it is at most zero. It's mo at most P to the zero. So that tells you that the five part of Shaw for this rank two elliptic curve is trivial. This is um, something you can't compute any other way. In theory, okay, in, in practice. In theory, of course, you could do a P descent by just computing the P Selmer group. But that would require adjoining to the rational numbers all the five torsion on this elliptic curve, which has a surjective mod five representation. So you get an enormous field, and then you have to keep the class number and the class group, and it's um, really infeasible in practice. Maybe if you assume GRH, you could do it. But that's just five. Um, you can do, using periodic approaches, you can, say, in very little time, in a half second, do exactly the same calculation for seven, and 11, and even 23. And here you're definitely getting beyond what you could conceivably do anytime soon from an algebraic number theory approach by computing Selmer groups. You're getting the same information, really, um, that the Selmer group is just a rank 2. It's the same as the Mordell Vey group, and there's no shot. So here, this tells us that the, there's no 23 torsion in the Schaffer-Avich Tate group of the elliptic curve 389A of rank 2. Um, for elliptic curves that have analytic rank 0 and 1, there is a theorem of um, kali wagen which leads to an algorithm that allows you to just once and for all say, the order of the schaffer average Tate group divides a specific integer that you can compute using Hegner points. But when a curve has rank greater than or equal to 2, um, like 3, 4, 5, whatever, um, there's no, that theorem doesn't give you any information currently at all. Um, whereas this approach gives you substantial information for curves of any rank, but only one prime at a time. So um, some more timing. So for example, showing that the 29 part of Shaw is trivial using the code in SAGE takes 2.2 seconds. And 31. Um, so most of the time in doing this is taken by computing the periodic L series, as you can see here. Uh, another part of the calculation is E dot P adic regulator. This is, um, this uses Monsky, Washington, cohomology and all kinds of cool stuff. But at the end of the day, it's fast. It takes about a quarter of a second. Even as P gets much bigger, it's very fast. And the main reason it's fast beyond having a really good algorithm, which allows you to compute to high precision, is that David Harvey wrote a very, very fast implementation. Um, so that's not the bottleneck at all in this calculation. So um, now let me motivate what is in PSAGE. Uh, tech typesetting, I guess that's visible now. OK, so that's too small. So I wanted to do a bigger calculation and verify that the P part of Shaw is trivial for lots of elliptic curves of rank 2 and um, lots and lots of primes P. And using the code that's already in SAGE, I could do this, but the table would be very small and unimpressive. So I wrote um, brand new code to do the same thing where I just computed exactly what I needed about the piotic L function and completely avoided using any of the code in SAGE except um, as a double check in some cases. And of course, I use the piotic regulator code. So here's the sort of conclusion that I got. Um, basically, I, well, I verified that the um, P part of Shaw is trivial for the curves of rank 2 having conductor up to 30,000 and all good ordinary primes for which the mod P representation is surjective and P is up to 1,000. So with some hypotheses on the primes, if you take any elliptic curve of rank 2 up to conductor 30,000, you know that the BSD formula is true at all primes up to 1,000 that are good and ordinary. So that gives good evidence for um, the uh, BSD conjecture for curves of rank 2. Does this depend on that nope. conjecture about the algebraic L series? No, nope. nope, because enough is proved about... So Kato and Schneider and Perrin-Rio um, have proved enough about the main conjecture of Iwasawa theory that um, this is unconditional. 
it's, uh, it would be more difficult, possibly, if uh, Sha were non-trivial. But it isn't in any of these examples. And it's not just rank 2, by the way. It's rank greater than or equal to. So there are some curves of rank 3 that are included here, for which the calculation took longer. But um, the P only goes up to 1,000. So, but it... Would you compute the analytic order of Sha? Is it 1 or 2 or... Well, in all cases, it's 1.00000 in these tables. We don't actually know that it's you know, not a transcendental number, unfortunately. So when I say that I verify the P part of the BSD conjecture for those primes, I mean assuming that the um, order of Sha is actually an integer. Um, I have no idea how for even a single elliptic curve of rank greater than or equal to 2 to show that the conjectural order of Sha is not a transcendental number. So, but beyond assuming that it is, then, then you get this. And yeah, it's always conjecturally trivial. So it's not like I'm supposed to find some like big prime that divides the order of Sha. Uh, in fact, I think that for a, um, I think you have to go up to some enormous conductor in the, I don't know, hundreds of millions or something to get an example where an odd prime divides the order of Sha and the curve has positive has rank greater than or equal to two. So I found an example like that, or Mark Watkins found an example like that in our tables. Um, but it's it's very hard to find. Almost always when you look at curves of rank greater than or equal to 2, the conjectural order of Shaw is trivial, or at most divisible by 2. Maybe it's a power of 2. But here, um, notice that I'm excluding small primes. I don't know whether any of these have Shaw of order divisible. No, I know some of them may, will probably have Shaw of order 4, but none will have Shaw of order um, 9. Oh, I thought you said they had 1.000. Um, I was wrong. It's either 1.00 or 4.00. I think it's 1.00 actually, but it's possible, given what I know, that it might be 4. So it's 1.00 times a small power of 2, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so. You, you can't just compute it using, conjecturally using the BSD formula? You can. The of course you can. It's in Kermodus tables called uh, uh, All Shaw. You can just, it's on his website. I just don't remember whether, I don't care about 2 because I'm not doing that calculation. And anyways, you know, you know what, you don't need this approach. You can just compute this two Selmer group. So you already know that BSD is correct at two for all these curves because um, you know the two Selmer groups. If there are any with non-trivial two-part of Shaw, then you have to probably do a four, four descent to verify BSD for those curves. <clears throat> Pretty sure I suggested that to somebody as a project once, but it didn't happen. Okay, so what's the code look like? Um, so remember, the point of mentioning this is that PSAGE, that is, there's some additional code that's not included in SAGE yet. It's currently at track ticket 12545. You could apply the patch there and then run this code. Um, it's an optimized Cython implementation, and it's fast enough to do that calculation in a couple of days. Um, it doesn't address the super singular case or multiplicative case at all. Re-education. Um, that looks funny. So, uh, so you have this, and I'm just going to show you a little bit about what that code looks like. So, um, looking at this block here, I'm just going to zoom out so you can see it. I'm just going to point out a few key things about it. So, this is exactly the analog of the code I showed you before, which implements that doubly nested sum, but um, it's Cython code, and it um, basically well, here I don't think you really see anything that's specifically Cython-ish except the SIG on, SIG off stuff. Um, but also, if you just see the way the code is written, it has an if some case that involves the precision, and the comment is some, some issue about you don't have to worry about overflow in this case, and it does a bunch of arithmetic. The actual objects for which you're doing arithmetic are um, long ints in that case, and or polynomials that are defined using um, directly using the Flint library. So that's the sort of thing you have here. And if the precision might overflow in that case, then it uses another um, implementation of basically everything. So for example, computing the measure, there's a special implementation that uh, works for small inputs, and there's another implementation that works for bigger inputs. And there's some absolute bound on how big stuff can be. Um, so it'll either use longs or long longs, depending on which case you're in. And this sort of thing gives you um, just, it's sort of like a formal exercise to take code that's completely general that in theory would work for very, you know, arbitrarily large powers of p, but in fact is so slow it would never work for arbitrarily large or even very big powers of p, and make code that will only work for small powers of p, 
but is in fact so fast that it could in fact be run for large powers of p, but it would just die and give wrong answers. <laughs> so there's a formal way of doing that in many cases. And I kind of just applied that formalism here, and um, here's what happens. So here's, how to, here's just an example of using that code. So I make um, the elliptic curve. It's not, uh, it doesn't sort of take over the existing code. It's a completely different object, p adic L series. And you can ask where the p adic L series attached to the elliptic curve at a given prime. And there you are. And you can see that looks maybe faster than what we were seeing before. So instead of nearly two seconds, it's 0.04 seconds. And here's another example um, for 97. It's just computing the... Um, the polynomial p sub 2, so it's to very low precision. Again, it would, basically the complexity, if you wanted to do this for 3 instead of 2, it would take 97 times as long, roughly speaking. Um, let's just compare this to the code that's included in Sage already. So instead of taking um, 0.03 seconds, which is what we're getting up there, it's still running. Um, last time I tried this, it took about 21 seconds, and that one took about 0.05 seconds instead of 0.03. But basically, the difference in speed between the two implementations is a factor of hundreds, um, roughly four or five hundred. So that's, that's what you get. And that's not so uncommon for uh, a very general implementation using all the gen very general stuff and just thinking very carefully about using longs, worrying about overflow, and writing in Cython. That's the sort of differences you get. And that's just for 97. So you can see how if I were going to do, try to you know, go up to 1,000, it would have been completely infeasible using the code that's in Sage. I might have gone up to 100 in a reasonable amount of time, but um, using this new code, I can go a lot farther. Also, um, when I wrote it, there was one example where it was giving a wrong answer due to some weird overflow issue, and there's a lot of double checks. I mean, basically what you're doing is you're solving for the order of Sha in some formula and getting one. And if you do anything wrong, you get some ridiculous piatic number. So that happened, and I was very you know, puzzled about why it happened. And unfortunately, it took, I think, 12 hours to get to the point where the error occurred, because it was some big prime with you know, five digits. And, um, and I was very impatient. So I'm doing my work on uh, Sage.Math, which has 24 cores. And I'd be much happier if I could make a little change and run it for 30 minutes instead of 12 hours. So I wrote a version that is. Um, it just parallelizes that sum. It's really easy to parallelize a big sum. And so I parallelized the sum, and that code is in this um, thing called series, undersc or series underscore parallel. And so let's just look at what I did here. Um, I just tried it out here, and you can see that um, for this example, this was on my two-core laptop. Using the parallel version, it's twice as fast as using the serial version. So um, that's nice. But when you do this same thing on sage.math, it's 24 times faster. So I could try something out, wait 30 minutes, and see what happened instead of having to wait 12 hours. And this made my debugging life a lot easier. Um, so when you're looking at a particular periodic L series, it's nice to have that option. Um, and that was, again, like a fairly low precision thing that I wanted to compute, but I still had to wait quite a while. Um, that code's in the uh, ticket. It, yep, it's in the ticket. And let me show you what it looks like. Um, so as everyone hopefully knows, if you do some function question mark, um, double question mark, sorry, you'll see the source code. And here it is. And this is in Cython, but all I do is um, I define a function. You can pass in optionally the number of CPUs. Otherwise, it'll just default to the number of CPUs on your computer. Right at the beginning of the function, it uses a decorator called at parallel and defines a little function that calls something else. And then the extra code over here calls that function and puts together the results. So nested functions and decorators are all supported in Cython now. Um, so you can do this. The only thing you can't do is you couldn't make this, say, a cdeft function. It has to be a normal deft function. But it's nice that you can do this right in the middle of a Cython program. And this is a nice way of uh, making your code parallel. Um, what the app parallel decorator does is it changes the function so that uh, if you give it the inputs that are specified, then it doesn't do anything differently. But if you give a list of inputs, it'll iterate over the list of inputs, doing them in parallel, and then it um, yields the answers as a generator. So you get them back as they appear, along with the inputs that produce those answers. It uses fork under the hood. So it's parallel, but it only works on one computer. It works really well on SMP computers. Um, can yes. I, can you use the CDU as a space? 
What? Can you can use a thread? No, it um, has to use fork, not thread. So, the, so um, a constraint is that these guys will have access, in a sense, these guys have access to the exact state of the program at this point, but anything they change will be in, uh, you know, change on write, or copy I guess on copy on write, um, copy of the program. So, uh, so when you do this, this function, the output, you have to like, take the output that it produces and then do something with it in your original program. It's not multi-threaded. Um, and the reason that that's not supported is because Python has very bad support for computationally intensive multi-threaded programs because of something called the global interpreter lock, where you can't modify two, object, two Python objects at the same time. And that causes trouble. Whereas if you fork your process, then you get an exact... You get a bunch of exact copies of your process, and you can, of course, modify the same object at the same time, because the second you modify it, the operating system just allocates actual new memory for that part of the process. It's very cheap. Um, the overhead's like a millisecond or something, or maybe less for doing this at parallel thing. Okay. All right, so I'm almost done. Um, so the last thing I want to mention, let's see how I'm doing on time. I think I'm doing very well. So the last thing I want to mention is, here's another direction in which you can push the calculations I was mentioning. So, uh, it's definitely too small. That's good. Okay, so um, here's another theorem in this paper with uh, Chris Wethrick that is got using this code that I was just showing you, the faster code. If you take the elliptic curve 389A that I started with, which has rank 2, and you just start... Uh, trying to show that Sha EP is zero for good ordinary primes, which is most of the primes. There's like, I mean, there's infinitely many super singular primes, but there aren't that many. Then um, I ran the calculation. For some reason, I stopped at 48,859. I have no idea why. Maybe our paper was due. I don't know. Um, this <laughs> semester was over. What? 16,231. Oh, that's not P equals comma. <laughs> yeah, I copied and pasted this from a tech document, and it didn't uh, do so well. So what happens at that prime? I will tell you. Something special does happen at that prime. So basically, you go look at all good ordinary, pr ordinary primes up to that bound, and for every single one, you know that Sha P is trivial, up to 48,859. Um, and there's like 10 super singular primes, which I said nothing. For any of the super singular primes, the existing Sage code is way too slow to get anywhere. It has to work in this quadratic extension of the p addicts, and it's just, just to get any approximation at all is just ridiculously slow. Um, maybe by this formal process of using Cython and being clever and thinking a little harder, maybe using Flint too, um, maybe you can, because I think, I don't know if the extension is unramified or not, but uh, just a quadratic extension. Maybe you could write a version that would deal with the super singular primes. Um, but there is something that happens with this prime 16,231, which can definitely be addressed. Um, just hasn't been done yet. So I leave it kind of right now as a challenge for somebody to deal with. But um, remember I said that you can compute the, the key inputs to showing that Sha P is zero, the key inputs to the theorems, are knowing the p-adic regulator and the p-adic L-series to sufficient precision. And the p-adic regulator, again, due to David Harvey's work, you can just compute that really quickly, even for a prime that's this large. It takes only four seconds to get it to this enormous precision. But notice that P cubed divides the p-adic regulator in this case. Um, most of the time, if you look at most of the other primes, and almost all the other primes, the p-adic regulator is only divisible by P squared, P to the power of the rank. And, um, but whenever the p-adic regulator is divisible by P cubed, or say P to the fourth, you need more precision. So instead of needing um, dot series two, you need dot series three in order to get enough precision of the p-adic L-series to verify that um, the Schaffer-Edge take group is trivial. And so you might think, oh, it's just one more digit, but the amount of extra time it takes is 16,231 times as long as this takes. And this actually takes quite a while. I don't remember the exact time using my code that it takes to do this, but I think it's on the order of an hour. And if you think about um, how long 16,231 hours is, um, it's roughly two years. So suddenly something that was about an hour becomes two years. And of course you could do it in parallel, and knock, maybe you, know, you can knock the two years down, but um, in less than two years, even in parallel, somebody should have done this using a better algorithm that will of course be able to deal with more cases. And there is a better algorithm, which um, 
is due to Rob Pollock and Glenn Stevens and Matt Greenberg and many other people, but mainly these people, I think. And um, if you look at track with a very small number, 812, which was created by Craig Citra a couple of years ago, he wanted to implement this but never got around to it. Um, but Rob Pollack did, and he's written a bunch of um, Sage code. It's a bunch of .sage files that get pre-parsed and everything, and they have no doc tests at all, and every time I look at them, I shiver. But <laughs> it actually, the code actually works um, in some cases. Right, Jen? It does actually sometimes work, and that is a huge, huge step compared to um, just looking at a paper that's kind of daunting. Also, in addition to that, there were some very nice lectures that Rob Pollack and Glenn Stevens gave at the Arizona Winter School describing the algorithm. So there are lots of grad students that kind of have a sense of how the algorithm works, and there's a nice description there. Um, so there's this code, which you can just get. And just to give you an example of what the code looks like, um, you can see that it's sort of like you wanted to get something that works. You can see like Rob going like this, and you know, if you know him. So he like wrote something. And, you know, commented something out and tried to rewrite it a different way, and then you tried to do this, but then this worked. And you know, if you use stage lot, you're probably pretty scared seeing doubly nested for loops to reduce a matrix mod Q. That's probably going to cost a lot, especially if this is maybe in you know, a, you know, key thing in an algorithm. I don't know, um, but uh, and even stuff like this looks kind of scary um, <laughs> to me. I mean, doing a for loop and adding a list to get a bunch of zeros at the end, like pretty much no line is the thing I would do. But this is code that in some cases works, so it's extremely valuable. And, um, and I really wish that it were in Sage. So my wish list. So um, my wish, which of course uh, it's very hard for wish lists to come true, but um, track 12545 has the code that I mentioned in Cython for computing Piatic L series at good ordinary primes for elliptic curves. Um, this code has been used a lot. I don't know of any bugs at all. It has about 50% doc test coverage. To get this code in, you need to write the other, or one, probably me, needs to write the other 50% of the doc tests, which is, I don't know, maybe 40 doc tests. And um, something for discussion with other people, you have to decide what the API should be. I mean, I just you know, wrote some Cython class called Piatic L series and so on, but um, I was the only user, really, and so I didn't really think that hard about a stable um, interface for how this code should work. So it'd be really cool if, that code could get finished, and then somebody else could review it, and by the end of the week, it had a positive review. I think that's probably a doable goal. Uh, by the way, there is some really cool stuff in that code I didn't mention. If you have a modular form on, uh, uh, with non-rational Fourier coefficients, you can also compute some things, at least, about the periodic L series for that, in some cases. At least you can compute the modular symbols map very, very efficiently. There's code for doing that, uh, like just optimal speed for computing the modular symbols map. And um, that's been used for a project be between me and Jennifer Balakrishnan and uh, what's it? Stefan Miller um, that involves coming up with a precise statement of an analog of piatic BSD for Jacobians of curves of genus 2 and 3 and so on. Um, obviously, another uh, wish list goal, not finishing track 812, I think that's totally infeasible this week, but making it so that instead of them be it being a bunch of .sage files, it's a bunch of .py files, and it's a, track, it's a patch against the Sage library. So at least you could apply a patch and then do, you know, import something and just try it out instead of having to attach something. And then th that would be a good first step because really there's hundreds and hundreds of functions there that will need doc tests. That will mean understanding what the heck they do, um, which is challenging, et cetera. So, and you'll probably want to, every time you look at it, you want to rewrite everything. And so it's scary, but I think just as a goal, make it so there's a patch against the Sage library. It just makes it easier to collaborate on the code. Um, the extraordinarily valuable code, if uh, Rob is listening to this, because it is. And in particular, try it out for p equals 16,231. See if somebody can show that Shaw is trivial for that one case. Um, using that code or even using another, there's rumored to be numerous implementations of that algorithm in various people's, um, on various people's laps, laptops. So um, if there's another implementation, try it out. So can somebody compute the periodic L series for that prime for that elliptic curve to sufficient precision. Um, also, another kind of formal programming exercise, like I mentioned before, is uh, I wrote this Cython code that's hundreds and hundreds of times faster than the code in Sage. And it, you know, it's the formal exercise of using C data types and bounding precisions and so on. And I did it for good ordinary primes. An exercise would be to do it for 
super singular primes, or primes of multiplicative reduction. So uh, both those cases I didn't think about at all. Um, so it would be nice if somebody could not do that necessarily, but at least investigate doing that. And a nice thing is that you have existing code, and you can watch exactly what it does at every step. You're just porting exactly that algorithm to be faster. You don't change the algorithm doesn't change in the slightest. Um, so this would be really useful to have. And in fact, when I was writing my version when, and debugging it, I would you know just step through and see exactly what was happening in each step of the sum, and you know something were wrong, I would detect it that way. So it's that's why I call it a formal programming exercise rather than a mathematical one. The math part is just trivial or technical stuff like figuring out, you know, if you multiply two numbers and add something, are you going to overflow or not? Um, and then another thing is just investigating extending stuff to modular forms of non-rational Fourier coefficients. For example, in Sage, one thing I didn't mention is you can compute the periodic L series of an elliptic curve twisted by a quadratic character. So if you have an elliptic curve E and uh, D, a square-free integer, you can compute the periodic L series of E twisted by D directly without having to just compute the other elliptic curve, find the modular symbols there. So there's formulas that just use the modular symbols for the original elliptic curve. And one could adapt those formulas for non-rational Fourier coefficients. I think Jennifer is very interested in being able to do that uh, in more generality. But also just doing that very quickly for elliptic curves over Q would be good. Okay, so that's my whole talk. Any questions? Yes? So, um, first, in this trash flow, uh, yeah. um, how, did, how did you represent, like, the average? Just, just like, the array? Or I, use, I think I use Flint polynomials to represent polynomials over the piatics. I never what? represented a piatic as anything other than an integer, except when I output the answer. Oh, I see. So, so basically something mod p power. Yeah. Uh, I'm in a fortunate situation where um, there aren't any denominators, and there's a theorem which tells you uh, at the end of the day, basically you can, you're computing some polynomial, really, and you know that it's congruent to the actual series you're trying to approximate, and you know for each coefficient exactly what power of big O of P you got. So you know that these two are congruent mod P to the 7 by a, a theorem. And so I just do everything over the integers, possibly reducing mod some big power of P to avoid coefficient explosion. And then at the very end, when outputting the answer, you just turn them all into piatic numbers to the right precisions. So I don't have to like keep track of, I don't care, uh, I don't care about the piatic precision as I go, because I know at the end what I, I have to throw away a lot anyways. So that may be very unexciting to people who like doing p basic piatic arithmetic. Uh, but it is, in general, the right way to do Yeah, <laughs> it's, a way of, yeah it's, a, it's a common experience. Um, I, I think, like, in all code I've ever written in my whole life, I've never actually, except for the very smallest basic stuff, used piatics directly. It's always been, like, rationals or integers and then turning it into that at the end. Um, but I've used code that does that. I just haven't written it, that's all. Is that it worth it to, to have a piatic class <laughs> like that? You know, like... Well, when you're certainly when you're playing around with the answers, it's nice to represent the numbers. So I need the to display the answer. I need it. This is what fixed mod should be. Yeah. Fixed mod should be occasionally reduced mod some high power p support. Oh, I see. Yeah, the thing just needs to be sped up. But you, we have some list in it, yeah. And the list you get updated every computation, no? Like, yeah, there's a property that says list, which gives you what the PID property. Well, that's, that doesn't happen. That's only for printing. You don't want to do that. Yeah, that's what it's... Unless you really wanted to represent the actual production to get to the top, which means you can't do the top. So you actually the coefficient. Are there other questions? If you wanted to do some of this over number fields, like total real fields, there's, it's a huge project. Um, I sadly don't know how to define the piatic L function over Q root 5, because I don't have modular symbols. Uh, any Iwasawa theorists in the room have anything to say? Like, maybe, maybe you could define them in the case of um, odd degree, where you have your modular symbols type thing, or your dual to modular symbols type thing. Ben? Yeah, I think I've seen a paper somewhere that did overconvergent modular symbols for I think that piece is okay. Just 
integrating. I don't even know what that. I I personally don't know what that means even because there's no cusp. So, what's a modular symbol? But I'm not saying that you can't do it because apparently you can. Um, but yeah, I'd love to. It would. You'd also have to generalize theorems for it to be useful, because. <laughs> but I yeah, I've never really seen much about piadic analogs of BSD over totally real fields yet. But I'd love to see that, obviously, because I'm a big fan. Um, and yeah, it would be really cool if, in the case where your modular symbols are defined, if there were some like direct way of of uh, getting um, an interpolation property, or you know, a con congruences for special values twisted by a character, because that's basically what you need to define a piadic L function and prove it that it exists. So. So this paper, right, there's this paper of Drummond and Pollock about computing structures that are open to the modular symbols. Is that an example of? Maybe. Is that? I, are the elliptic curves defined, defined over Q, though? Are the elliptic curves defined over? I mean, the, there's a totally real field there, but the elliptic curve, I the think, is defined over Q. Yeah. Um, or the Stark Hagner hypothesis? I still think you have the modulus. Yeah. I'm curious who in the room has any interest in working on anything on my wish list this week. I do. Okay, good. Excellent. I, I think it's somewhat reasonable, especially like investigate the possibility. I mean, all that is is just look at code and bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? Oh yes. This, this, this underscore series function, the one that was using for parallel. Yes. Uh, like, what's, what, what's that function doing? Underscore series. Series underscore parallel? Or? No, 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 no. no. It, it's inside there. In the code, yeah, yeah. When you define absolute function. Oh, it's just, a, it was, it's just, uh, it's doing the actual calculation. Um, basically, it's computing a little piece of that uh, so finite the, sum. The yeah, I broke it up. I made a version of the series calculation that, uh, computed just a piece of the sum. And so the big part, the big one option, you know, the default is it just computes the whole thing. But if you do it in parallel, you chunk it up, and then you do each piece. So. Yeah, can this have like a CDEF call something CDEF inside the series? Like, yes. Um, in fact, LDA underscore series is probably CPDEFed. I'll have to take a look, though. But if you, let's see, all I have to do is go to one of those things that said the code. Um, So this is the actual code. This is cdeft, but I am pretty certain it could be. It's yeah. Sorry, it's deft, but I'm pretty certain certain you could just change it to cpdef, and it would work. It wasn't in this particular application. It wouldn't make any difference because the complexity of what you're doing is so big. I mean, you're it's you know, one hour versus I mean a minute. But yeah, you could use the same approach with uh, cpdef. Uh, maybe cdeft as well. I think so, because a deft function in, can certainly have C, call cdeft code inside of it, and it's all in Cython. So, yeah, I think it could be done with cdeft. But there's a one millisecond overhead in forking the process, which will just kill any advantage in this particular case to, to that, because um, the call overhead for a deft method is way, way less than a millisecond. A millisecond is like a thousandth of a second. It's like a huge amount of time in computer, computer time. So much can happen in a millisecond. <laughs> a million things can happen in a millisecond. <laughs> okay, so thanks.